Hi there, this is Julie Entwistle, and today for our webinar, we're going to be talking about occupational therapy and housing, with the goal of trying to demystify the role that occupational therapists play when dealing with housing and home modifications. So the agenda for this webinar is that we're going to speak about the occupational therapy role with regards to immediate, short-term, and long-term housing solutions. These are the three ways that we will phase our need for home modifications around the client's situation and um, basically how, as they recover, their housing needs may change and how we address that. And then we'll talk about housing assessments and why uh, you may want to consider Amosil Power as your vendor for completing these assessments when they're required. So in terms of going home, I always like to start with a comic. Okay, Ms. Feldman, it says on your chart that you were discharged yesterday. Um, as many of you have probably experienced, the process of being discharged from hospital is not always, we'll say, well organized or coordinated in that often we get a call 3 o'clock on a Friday for a client who's leaving in the next two hours. And that leaves us very limited time to coordinate the equipment, the care, and the resources required to make sure that hospital discharge goes smoothly. Um, but the process really is outside of our control if the hospital makes a decision that they no longer need to keep that individual um, Then there's very little that we can do um, to change their timelines So When someone's going home, obviously there's some main things we need to look at first one is equipment uh, When they're inpatient, they are going to be trialing some equipment um, some of the key Markers for their discharge are going to include their mobility. Are they able to get out of bed and to walk around short distances? Are they able to get uh, to and from the washroom or can they use the toilet? And uh, sometimes they'll also look at stairs. Can they negotiate a few stairs? Um, with that, the hospital OT typically will outline a list of equipment that is required to assist the client. Uh, based on the trials that they've done. So maybe they'll require a walker or they'll need a commode or a shower chair. And typically the OT there has not seen the client's home environment. And that's one of the barriers to making sure the equipment is really accurate. Often the equipment is uh, good in theory, but when we get that equipment into the home, it doesn't accommodate the client's needs because of the circumstances of, of the location in which they live. So we typically need to modify the equipment prescribed by the hospital once we're in their real environment. Beyond equipment, the other aspect of helping a client go home from hospital is their care. And in the Ontario auto insurance industry, this is where we use a Form 1 document to calculate their care needs. Coordinating care often becomes the role of the treating OT in that people are going to require assistance typically. Uh, after a hospitalization and they don't always have family or other supports available. Lastly, we want to look at home modifications. Um, most homes are not easily accessible, so if we have a client who is unable to manage stairs or to walk, then we often have barriers to entry. And um, there's multiple other barriers as well, but getting them in the door is often the first challenge. But in terms of home modifications, we do look at three phases of this, and I'm going to turn them immediate needs, meaning to get them out of the hospital, into their home, and managing at home for the very, very immediate future. Then we look at short term. How is that environment going to work for them for the next one to two years? And then we look at long term. What are they going to require for two years and beyond? And um, there's different uh, strategies and decisions that get made during each one of those periods. So in terms of discharge, there's really five main housing objectives that we need to look at to facilitate discharge. The first one, as I mentioned, is getting in and out of the home. Uh, obviously, they need to be able to get in the door, and then once they're inside, they need to be able to get out. We need to look at where they're going to sleep, how they're going to use the washroom, are they going to be able to shower, and how are they going to get to and from a bed, a chair, or the toilet. If we have major barriers in, um, with respect to their pre-accident home in looking at these five key criteria, we have to look at alternatives because, as I said, the hospital is going to facilitate discharge whether the home environment is ready or not. And so often, if, these, uh, if there's some significant challenges to overcome, we need to look at alternatives including a rental location, a uh, condo or apartment, uh, sometimes retirement home or convalescent care, sometimes long-term care, and I've even had clients discharged to a hotel. 
Of course, we can also look at alternative locations such as family members or friends. Um, but uh, the problem solving metric really tries to look at getting them into their pre-accident environment first. And if that's not going to happen in the, the immediate future, then we need to look at some of these alternatives, which are quite costly. So we look at getting in and out of the home, uh, common options to facilitate um, getting people to be able to access their home in the first place. is obviously having attendant supervision or support, and that would be in cases where they need help to get up a ramp or to use stairs. Um, for stairs, we often do look at providing a ramping system, whether that's a small suitcase ramp, which is something that is portable and removable, whether it's a custom ramp or whether it's a modular or a, uh, a system that gets put together on site that can be removed later on. And we need to consider whether we want to rent or purchase these items. Um, obviously, we'd like to make good decisions around funding. So if the cost to rent over a certain period of time is going to exceed the cost to purchase, then obviously we will look at purchasing. Um, a lot of times when we're looking at access into the home, we need to look at railings, um, exterior railings, and sometimes inter interior railings as well. Uh, porch lifts are a common solution for getting people to manage the, um, the grading difference between their driveway or um, <clears throat> you know, the entry point to their home and then the actual door. And a porch lift is often a more efficient uh, way to solve that problem because ramps, uh, based on the scale we need to build a ramp, um, they're typically very long. So for example, if we have a 36 inch difference between the ground and the door, we would need a 36 foot ramp. And often places don't have the space for that. So a porch lift can span that difference quite uh, easily. And sometimes when we're not able to ramp or put a lift in front of the home um, in order to facilitate them coming home, they're often coming home on patient transfer. Um, which is where they are um, brought into the home on a stretcher by um, attendants and um, obviously not ideal, but it is an option uh, at times. And often we're looking at multiple options. So they may have a railing on their stairs, but still need the help of an attendant um, as an example. So these are some pictures of some of the items I was talking about. Top left is our suitcase ramp. So that's a ramp that can span a small number of stairs. Um, and can be removed and um, taken, say, in a vehicle to somebody else's home. The top middle picture is of a porch lift, again, spanning a larger distance, and you can see it takes up a pretty small amount of space, and that can be rented. Top right picture, we're dealing with threshold ramps. These are small rubber ramps that we use to manage over thresholds between uh, doors. And bottom left, we're looking at railings. Obviously, there's many different types of railings that can be installed. And bottom right, we're looking at a modular ramp, which is more of a system that can be built on site and can be removed when the person no longer needs it. So the second aspect we talked about for going home is uh, sleeping. Common options for people in terms of where they're going to sleep when they're out of hospital. Um, often we are relocating their sleeping space to the main level because that is, uh, takes out stair negotiation usually, um, which is something they often struggle with. So we do try to find a spot on the main floor where they can sleep. Um, instead of moving their bed, which is not always suitable, we're often renting or purchasing a hospital bed for that main level. Uh, we can also achieve a similar um, sort of sleep position with devices like wedges or pillows, but a hospital bed is typically more suitable because the client can adjust their positioning on their own and it has uh, height differentials for uh, facilitating transfers to and from bed to a piece of equipment. Um, <clears throat> often, if we can, assist them to manage levels to their pre-MVA bedroom. That's where people would prefer to sleep. But there's multiple things to consider, not just getting to the pre-MVA bedroom, but the width of the doorway, the height of the bed, how suitable the bed may be based on their injuries. Uh, a lot of people resort to sleeping on recliners or couches. We don't recommend that because it is um, quite horrible ergonomically to sleep that way and um, not great from a care perspective either. And then, of course, we talked about alternative accommodations. Obviously, if we're helping a client to relocate to an apartment or a condo or a care facility or a hotel, um, the bedroom is typically on the same level as their bathroom. So here's just some um, pictures of examples. So top left is a hospital bed just in someone's living room. Not ideal and um, quite invasive in terms of lack of privacy, but often a solution we do have to 
resort to. Top right is a picture of someone using wedges or pillows to uh, maintain an upright position. Um, bottom left is obviously a picture of someone on a couch, which can sort of demonstrates the um, poor position that they're in. And then bottom right is somebody using a recliner and pillows to be propped up and trying to be comfortable. When we look at going to the bathroom, um, some common options we need to consider are uh, often main levels of homes do have a small bath, which is typically a toilet and a sink. And sometimes we need to look at widening the door uh, because often these doors are quite narrow and that really impedes somebody from being able to access that room uh, with a wheelchair or a walker. If we can't widen the door, uh, sometimes just using a swing away hinge gives us an extra inch or two of clearance for uh, access in a wheelchair. If there is a bathroom or a toilet on that level, often we're looking at using a grab bar, a versa frame, or a raised toilet seat uh, in order to facilitate the transfer and the, uh, their safe ability to get on and off the toilet. If getting into the bathroom is not possible, then we can look at bedside toileting with a commode uh, for bowel or bladder. Or sometimes the toileting has to happen in bed, which would include a bed pan, a urinal, sometimes um, it's catheter, or an in-bed bowel program. Obviously, uh, toileting in bed requires a lot more care and is not typically the way that people prefer to, uh, to use the washroom. So um, if we can, we try to facilitate a more, I'll call it normal, or um, a process that requires less care. And um, based on their injury, you know, the bowel and bladder programs may be managed quite differently. Um, so they may have to drain their bladder in a different way than they drain their bowels. So we need to consider that as well. These are some examples. The top left is a bursa frame, which provides support for getting on and off the toilet, but does not change the height of the toilet. Um, top middle is a commode that we wheel over the toilet. So the transfer would happen in the bedroom um, beside the bed, and then they could be transitioned over the toilet. Um, the top right is also a commode, but you'll see that this has the wheels um, that the client would be able to propel that themselves. Um, bottom left is just a picture of someone that would be using a bedside commode so they can transfer from bed onto the commode. Um, middle picture is a bed pan. Bottom middle is a urinal, which is obviously suitable for males, not suitable for females. Um, then we have a raised toilet seat with arms, so uh, the height of the toilet changes and also there's support for the transfer. And then the last picture on the right is a swing away hinge which just tries to demonstrate how um, the door ends up swinging away behind the door frame, which frees up another inch or two of space for clearance through the door. When we're looking at showering, um, <clears throat> often this is our biggest challenge because most bathrooms that have showers tend to be located upstairs um, or they're, they're poorly accessible. So often, uh, immediately coming home from the hospital, people are looking at a bed bath or a sponge bath um, with a hair wash basin in the bed so they are basically cleaning themselves um, in the bedroom. Um, we can also look at having a portable shower on the main level, and I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, not always suitable, but helpful if it is workable. Uh, if we do widen a bathroom door uh, or we have swing away hinges, that may promote access into the bathroom. It does not necessarily mean the shower is going to be accessible, but it may provide them with access to a sink where they could do some sponge bathing um, in front of the sink. And if necessary, we would look at removing shower doors or putting in devices such as bath seats, benches, chairs, and shower heads if they're able to get into their shower um, with some modifications. <clears throat> and like I said, showering is often the most difficult problem to solve and something that uh, tends to take us a little bit longer than some of the other solutions. So just in terms of pictures, top left is a, um, a portable shower that can be put on the main floor of a home. It has a uh,
system to drain the water and needs a water source, obviously. <clears throat> top middle is just an example of bed bathing. Um, top right is a hair wash basin where you can fill that basin with water to wash somebody's hair while they're lying in bed. Bottom left is just a, a handheld shower. And the picture in the bottom middle just shows how when we remove shower doors, it provides us with more access for the individual and also their care provider and gives us more options for installing equipment. And then um, bottom right is a transfer bench um, where the person can transfer outside of the tub and then bring their legs over and um, have a shower inside the tub. When looking at transfers, um, <clears throat> a lot of people do need supervision or assistance with their transfers, especially after an acute injury. And that would include transfers to and from chairs, uh, couches, wheelchairs, beds, toilets. Um, <clears throat> we can look at providing devices such as a super pool or a bed rail, and I'll show you photos of those. Uh, mobility device, meaning a walker, wheelchair, cane, those can assist with the transfer by providing some stability and um, some safety. Uh, if necessary, we look at floor or ceiling lifts where people are actually lifted from one place and relocated to another. And some people are um, discharged from hospital with a slide board or they're trained on how to do pivot transfers where they're standing and pivoting very uh, carefully before they would sit down in, in the next surface. Usually the client is taught it's the safe transfer technique before discharge, but in the hospital it's practiced on uh, typically a hospital bed that is height adjustable uh, to another surface that would be um, level to the bed. When at home we have a few more transfers that we're working on and different heights get involved. So while they may learn how to transfer in sort of one position at the hospital, that may not translate into their ability to transfer at home. So here are some examples. Um, the bottom left is a picture of, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, portable ceiling lift that can be installed and removed. Uh, and that would transfer someone out of bed and into a chair without uh, needing to be lifted by a caregiver. The top middle picture is a ceiling track lift, so that is one that is installed in the ceiling that can lift someone up out of bed. Uh, top right is a super pole, so those are spring-loaded. They don't need to be attached um, permanently to a floor or a ceiling, but they allow somebody um, the option to grab and give leverage for standing coming out of bed. Bottom left is a slide board transfer from a bed to a wheelchair. I'd recommend supervision for those types of transfers. And then uh, bottom middle is obviously a caregiver assisting with a transfer. Um, also, you know, can be dangerous for the caregiver and the client and not something that we typically recommend if there is an, a better alternative. And then the bottom right is a um, what we, we would call a Hoyer lift or a floor-based lift where that can be wheeled to where the client is. Um, those are helpful if they wanted to transfer, say, to a couch or if they uh, were to fall on the floor and needed to be transferred off the floor um, back into another surface. So when we look at short-term, um, that is when we have someone living in their home for a longer period of time. It's not just about getting them out of the hospital, it's about getting them comfortable and optimally functional while we sort out our long-term solutions. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a comic that says, this town ain't accessible for the both of us. So when we look at short-term, we want the problems to be a little bit more permanent and hopefully for the client to be more independent, requiring less care if possible, or if not more independent, uh, more safe. So. When we're looking at access, we typically then would move forward with purchasing a ramp or a porch lift, ideally that the client can use independently. And you know the price from that can vary significantly depending on the prep work required, but there's a range there. Uh, we do prefer people to have a second egress if possible. So even if they can just get out of a smoke-filled space to um, a deck or a balcony um, off, say, the kitchen or um, you know, if they're coming in and out of the garage and we can get them to the front porch, um, having a second means of exiting the home is often uh, helpful and recommended. Uh, we do prefer them to have a covered entrance and exit. So obviously if they can get in and out of the home without having to um, be exposed to the elements of snow, ice, rain, um, that is preferred. But not everybody has an attached garage or a car, carport or some other um, method of, of being able to get into their home um, through a covered space. 
And often if they're using a mobility device, it is difficult to uh, open the door and push the door open while they're trying to wheel or move through it. So we look at remote door openers, uh, which are a couple thousand dollars to install so that they can push a button and the door will open, much like you would see out in public with the, um, the wheelchair accessible doors. Toileting, uh, we would like to, uh, for the short term plan, move forward with having an accessible washroom. So we want them to be able to access the bathroom, which is typically uh, through widening of a door. Um, if we're looking at um, you know, using a commode, then we would want the commode to be able to fit over the toilet. Sometimes that requires the toilet to be replaced, uh, and we need to purchase a self-propelled commode so they can wheel themselves over the toilet. Uh, we look at having sink access, which is often done with a wheel under or pedestal sink if they're using a wheelchair. If they're standing, then sometimes we need to look at raising um, a vanity to a different height so that they can access the sink without having to bend as much. In terms of showering, again, the same bathroom that they're getting into toilet is typically the shower we want to mod or the bathroom we'd like to modify for showering. So once they're into the bathroom, um, we like to install a wheel in or barrier reduced shower is ideal, or um, make sure that they've got a shower um, they can use with a tub transfer bench or lift. Handheld shower heads, grab bars, um, and to make a fully accessible bathroom, we're typically looking at between twenty to thirty thousand dollars, depending on obviously the space, um, their needs, uh, whether we're also looking at therapeutic bathtubs, uh, whether we need to borrow space from another room uh, to make the shower larger, and we like to make sure that they have good turning radius and the ability to have a caregiver uh, in the bathroom with them if that's still required. In terms of managing levels, we do like clients to be able to access their pre-accident bedroom or to get upstairs to put their kids to bed or to be able to use those areas of their home. <clears throat> so um, if it's suitable, we may look at a stair glide, um, which can be relatively inexpensive if the stairs are straight or can be get quite expensive if we're looking at a custom glide for stairs that turn or have a landing. Uh, telecab is a two-story elevator, so it'll take someone between two levels, and those are a great solution if the client has the space for it. Um, the disadvantage of a stair glide is obviously someone needs to transfer at the bottom and the top. A telecab, they do not need to transfer. And a full stop elevator um, that will stop between multiple levels, meaning the basement, the main floor, the upstairs, and maybe in a garage. Those are quite expensive and require quite a significant renovation. When we look at sleeping, obviously our goal with short-term housing is to help the client to access their previous sleeping area, and that usually requires us to manage levels. Um, we want them to be close to a bathroom, so they'll have a bathroom to use overnight, which usually requires widening um, a bathroom door that's close by, but also their bedroom door if it's not wide enough. Um, we often look at relocating furniture or changing rooms to accommodate access and space. We've uh, recommended purchase of a um, adjustable bed. Sometimes those come um, in a king size if we're dealing with a client and say their spouse. So um, a lot of bedrooms may not be able to accommodate that. So we may need to look at other bedrooms. And uh, that's when we typically purchase a bed so we know it's going to fit. And we get one with a, a suitable mattress based on their injuries. In terms of flooring, um, flooring can be a barrier when we're looking at transitions between different types of flooring. And so we often look at replacing some flooring with flooring that's more conducive for safe mobility, which is often wood laminate or tile. And of course the cost is going to vary, but the idea is that we have flooring that doesn't have transitions that are going to get caught on a wheelchair caster or a walker, et cetera. In terms of transfers, if we're renting equipment, we typically look to purchasing equipment. So if we're renting the Hoyer um, or if we're renting <clears throat> uh, some sort of lift device, we may want to install something that's permanent. In terms of the kitchen, um, we typically try to make uh, smaller renovations to the kitchen because a large-scale kitchen renovation is something we reserve more for the long-term plan. But if we want to try to improve wheelchair access, we may remove doors in front of the sink. We may um, advocate for a new stove with some controls that are mounted at the front for someone to reach, say, from a wheelchair. Side-by-side uh, -side fridge is a better appliance than a fridge that is has a freezer on the top and the fridge on the bottom. Um, or vice versa. <clears throat> and then obviously space changes to accommodate cooking or serving of meals. So looking at how the kitchen is used and how it could use, be used better with some small changes. 
And then obviously we look more in the short-term plan at leisure, so the ability to transfer to other furniture, such as sitting on the couch with the family, um, maybe getting a recliner as more of a, an option for um, a place to sit versus sitting in the wheelchair all the time. And then if they're looking at using the computer or need an office area, um, making sure that they can access that and use that appropriately. Just some examples, the top left is a picture of a telecab, so as I said, that goes between two levels. So when it's down, the top of it is the floor or the, uh, the room above it, and when it's up, the bottom of it is the ceiling for the room below. <clears throat> the um, top middle is just a commode that somebody could wheel themselves um, to get over the toilet. Top right is just an example of a barrier-free shower uh, where someone could get in and, and do a, a full turn in that bathroom with a pedestal sink that they could wheel under. Um, bottom left is just a comic of a dog on a stair glide. It looks like a dog glide, but stair glides, I'm sure a lot of people have seen those. Bottom middle is a um, automatic door opener that would be accessed by remote. And bottom right is just an example of a ramp put in a garage so that someone could pull into the garage and get into the home without having to be outside. Then we look at long-term, and long-term is again where we up the criteria even further because we look at creating spaces where people are going to live um, for quite some time. So in the auto insurance system in Ontario, um, when we're looking at long-term planning for housing, we always start with the housing assessment, and that's where we're looking at the total cost to make the home fully accessible. From there, once we establish a budget of what those costs would be, we can use those monies to renovate the home as prescribed, we can purchase a new home, and that may either involve buying a home that is a resale and modifying that if that's uh, less expensive. We may purchase a lot to try to custom build a new home, or we may try to find a new home development where we have a suitable floor plan that we can make some, some changes to uh, in the build stage. And obviously as an OT, uh, or all of us working with clients and dealing with housing, it's extremely important to consider the cost benefit of the short-term changes to the long-term housing strategy. So we all know there was a legislation change uh, June 1st, and um, people now have access to less monies. So my prediction is that, based on that, the short-term plan may be the only plan implemented under the SABs, where previously we may take housing monies and we may um, buy or build something and send, spend considerable dollars between three to 500000 or more on um, purchasing um, and modifying homes for long-term. Those budgets are, are shrinking with the change in legislation, and now we may be looking at spending more in the one hundred dollars to $200,000 range to make the home um, accessible in the short term, even though the, um, everything that we do in the short term is not typically ideal for a long term. So just some examples of um, you know, the types of houses we would look to build for someone for long term. Obviously, the top left picture, you have a large oversized garage, which could park a vehicle and get into the home that way. Uh, there's a barrier-free entry at the front. There's no rail ramp. There's no stairs. There's nothing's really been modified. It's just been built in a way that is conducive. And typically, the floor plans are nice and open, um, like the bottom left picture of an accessible kitchen. You can see there, there's a wheel under area um, by the sink and over to the range. Um, the dishwasher has been raised up. There's a wall oven, uh, lower drawers. And then, obviously, the bathroom on the right shows a proper vanity with a wheel under space and storage, nice big shower, big turning radius, and grab bars. So those are just some examples of things that we do in the long term, but not necessarily things that we um, spend the money on in the short term. So as an example, uh, just in terms of talking about the impact of housing on someone's quality of life and their care needs, a client with a spinal cord injury lives in an inaccessible home with a second story bedroom and a stair glide to get between levels. So the stair glide was part of the short term plan. Um, to get to therapy or work or anywhere and back. Um, so from his bedroom, he goes from his bed to a commode, wheels his commode into the bathroom where he gets on a shower chair. After showering, he goes back onto his commode where he wheels back to bed, transfers into bed to get dressed. From bed, he transfers back into his wheelchair. He wheels to the top of the stairs and transfers onto a glide. He takes the glide to the bottom of the stairs where he goes back to his another wheelchair, second wheelchair. From there, he leaves the house, so he goes in his wheelchair out to his car, where he transfers into his car. Um, when he gets to his destination, he transfers from his car to his wheelchair. When he um, goes in 
to wherever it is he's going and he needs to come back home again. He goes back, transfers back into his car. When he gets home, he transfers back into his wheelchair. That's 11 transfers to just get out of the house and back again for one thing. So imagine if he went to physio and then he came back and he went out to another appointment, had to go to the grocery store. So for dealing with accessibility, and we look at providing an accessible home and vehicle, that basically becomes, he would transfer from bed to a commode where he would go in, he'd be able to do his toileting and his showering from the commode. He'd go back to bed to uh, dry off and get dressed, and then he would transfer to his wheelchair, and he would be able to get into his vehicle in his wheelchair, and between the uh, levels with his wheelchair, so there's only three transfers. So when you look at the efficiency of that, I mean, obviously, his... Um, ADL, or ability to complete his activities of daily living, uh, efficiency improves. We protect the upper extremities by reducing the number of transfers. And then obviously the psychological desire to go places dramatically improves. You know, it's always important to do the, the milk test. You know, would I get, would I be able to go out and get milk? If I needed to make 11 transfers to go and get milk, no, I'm not going to go out and get milk. And I'm going to delegate that to someone else or ask for help. So it's important to look at accessibility as a really great solution um, for really encouraging people and enabling people to be able to manage um, their own affairs more efficiently. So long term, I just want to talk about the housing assessment. Typically, for the last 10, 15 years or more in auto insurance, um, we've been seeing housing assessments that are, um, are really, really expensive. So as rehab professionals, we've been really trying to find ways to stretch budgets and to minimize our own costs. Um, but the cost of these housing assessments have remained unchanged at six to $8,000 when you include disbursements and travel. A lot of them provide drawings that can't be used. So when you notice in the report, uh, the housing assessment report, you'll see um, that the price does not include, you know, and then it lists an amount for, for permit-ready drawings. What that means is the $2,000 you just paid for drawings is not drawings that can be used as the next phase of the process. And you have to incur those costs to get permit-ready drawings completed. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize as well is when you're using a housing vendor that does not involve an occupational therapist in their quote, they are going to the treating occupational therapist for input on the functional needs of the client. So there's additional costs um, for completing of, a, of the housing assessment um, based on the OT's time that's typically on a different treatment plan. Um, if I do a visit with the housing vendor, I'm typically spending four to six hours of treating, treatment time to assist the vendor with their assessment. So that is a cost in addition to the $68,000 for that vendor. And then, you know, we're often asked to administer their products. So here's our treatment plan, put this on HCI. Um, you know, they're not typically involved in, in the process. Um, they're just there to provide a service and require the OT to, uh, to manage the process for them. And then if the plans are denied, then the OT has incurred the time to put the, um, the product or the quote on HCI, and we are not funded to do the administrative paperwork for these vendors. Um, typically, the 18s for the finished product are denied. Um, because the insurer typically looks at the housing assessments as, um, you know, excessive in terms of costs, and um, the denial results in an insurance examination and delays. So what that means is I have a budget to try to move my client forward with housing, and now I have to uh, wait another three to six months for an assessment to see um, how that budget may change. Many OTs, including a lot of those in rehab programs, really don't understand housing. Um, and that's okay, because there's many aspects of occupational therapy that I don't understand. But because of that, they're really not able to develop comprehensive solutions, and they don't know the options. So it's important when dealing with housing that you're working with an occupational therapist that does understand housing, and that can be really um, creative and comprehensive in the solutions so that we're saving time and money. And working as the treating OT with the client on housing is really difficult. So it can be hard to balance what people want with what they need. And this can cause, you know, that treating relationship to be strained long term. So often I agree that it is better to have another vendor, vendor manage the housing piece um, because when we get into costly renovations and, you know, providing invasive solutions to people's personal space, it becomes um, pretty stressful between the therapist and the client. So what our solution was is we developed our own housing assessment product. So we were able to price our product at $2,000 for the OT assessment, um, which is an occupational therapy functional assessment of the home environment, including um, you know, rec 
recommendations for the changes required and the options for the different changes that are needed. And then um, $2,000 for the contractor who is going to come in and price the prescribed changes. And they'll put a dollar figure to what's recommended by the occupational therapist and come up with design drawings um, that showcase what changes are needed. Obviously, there's form completion fees and HST for the contractor. Um, the ones that we've done have been 100% approved so far, so we're not running into issues with treatment plan denials for our housing assessments. Um, in this, again, the OT provides the functional input and the prescription for the required changes, and the contractor does the concept drawings and the pricing. Uh, it's delivered as one cohesive report with one plan and one invoice, and we're able to turn these around in about four weeks. So our report um, for these housing assessments is comprehensive and we include functional considerations that, and needs from an OT perspective specific to that client. So these are not uh, cookie cutter copy and paste reports. We're really looking at the individual. Uh, we've done assessments for clients with visual disabilities, um, you know, wheelchair users, clients with um, you know, impaired mobility or um, balance impairment, um, et cetera. So these reports really need to be customized. There isn't just one solution that is called accessibility. Um, different people need different solutions based on their home and their injuries, and that needs to be respected in the process. Uh, our report also includes theories on the environmental change and the relationship of this to function. So we really build in that um, foundation that is occupational therapy into um, why the changes are necessary. Um, you know, we look at the needs and we do a thorough review of the as-built space. So we really do paint a picture of how this client lives in the space now and how that can be improved uh, with changes. And then we provide a cost summary that is clear and concise. If you are in this industry and you would like a sample of our report, please email me, julie at I'm happy to provide you with a sample of our housing product. We're very proud of it and feel that it really uh, serves a, a need in an industry where the current products are overpriced and the solutions are not complete in what we've seen so far. So thank you for listening to our webinar. Um, I, initially we had hoped to do this as a live webinar where there would be interactive questions, but due to some technical difficulties we decided to deliver this webinar this way. Um, but if you do have uh, any questions about uh, housing, about occupational therapy and housing, about our own housing product, please feel free to email me, julie at whistlepower.com. I always like to end on a comic. This is a crash test dummy and trying to get insurance and the um, insurance salesman is saying, I'm sorry, I'd like to offer you insurance, but with your driving record. Um, I also want to thank you for listening to our webinar and um, for participating in this. I hope it was helpful and I hope that there was some good learning that came from that. But if you want any more information on occupational therapy or at Whistle Power, um, please feel free to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. And if you haven't seen our blog, it's full of helpful information, tips, and strategies. We write a lot of um, really uh, interesting blog articles on occupational therapy and disability. Uh, we also have an OT video series that shares some great OT solutions for living and practical advice. And soon we will be launching our a Accessible for Ontario's with Disability Act customer service training program. That is a customized program that will help people working in the field of customer service, whether that's lawyers and law clerks or um, other businesses, at how to effectively um, help clients with disabilities by providing exceptional customer service. So ask us how we can help you become better than just compliant with the AODA legislation and help you excel at implementing strategies that will really provide great service. Thanks again for your time. Again, any questions, feel free to email me, julie at antwhistlepower.com, or give us a call in our office, 905-648-9593. Thanks so much.